Could the gentleman standing up in the middle aisle close that back door before you sit down? Good morning, and we'll call to order the meeting of the Regional Transportation Commission. Thank you, Mr. Just Chairman. Quickly. Members of the commission, your first item is to conduct your first citizens' participation period. It's the first time set aside for public comment. Those wishing to speak to the board on a posted agenda item, now is your opportunity. Seeing and hearing no one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're uh, hold on just for a second. Oh, See, seeing and hearing no one, we'll close this portion of public comment. Back of the house, we have another screen issued down here. Come on down. Go ahead, Tina. Okay. Next is next item number two is to approve the agenda. And we are, for administrative reasons, we do need to delete item number nine. Other than that, your agenda is in order and ready for your approval. Motion to approve this paper. There's a motion on the floor. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. And the motion carries. Thank you. Next, that brings us to item number 32, which is your item number 32 is to <laughs> I'm just consented in there. Hold on, I've got sorry, working from something different. Item number three is to receive the general manager's report. We do have a general manager's report. First up is our welcome to Councilman Isaac Barone. Thank you from North Las Vegas. Councilman Barone is a native of North Las Vegas and the first Hispanic member of the North Las Vegas City Council. He was re-elected to his second term in 2017. Councilman Barone is a Clark County school teacher and a long time community activist. So we look forward to the insight and experience he will bring to the RTC board as we work toward improving mobility and the quality of life for our residents. And I have to say, even though you are brand new as of today to our board, we have worked with you for several years now and have found you to be a partner and an advocate, um, inviting us to your events, including us in your conversations and just generally being interested in transit and transportation. So we look forward to having you as a part of our leadership. Thank you very much. It's a big honor actually uh, to be here. Um, I'm a, a, a big admirer, of course, uh, of a, a part of Flood, of course, uh, I, I didn't say much about them, but um, I guess I'm also on Flood now, too. I'm a big admirer of Flood <laughs> I've been and you, RTC. So well, and, and quite frankly, you know, I mean, uh, both boards have been very good to North Las Vegas. Yes. Especially to my ward, Ward 1. So thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Well, that's probably because um, Ward 1 has such a great leadership. Oh. So, <laughs> thanks. And Tina, for the record, <clears throat> for those of you that weren't here earlier, uh, the councilman showed up to Flood Control for his first meeting ever and immediately got a $6 million project approved. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, powerful. thank you. Uh, nice. Powerful. I, I'd like to say that it has nothing to do with it, right? Uh, other than maybe just, uh, maybe you guys should go play the lottery today. Yeah. 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 Take the credit now because you're going to get the blame later. So. Oh, Please. okay. <laughs> well, I, and of course, I always tell people, and uh, much to the chagrin of my, uh, of my colleagues on the city you. council, I always tell them, well, if it's happening in North Las Vegas, it's happening in Ward 1. <laughs> so I better stop right there before I get kicked, you know, by, <laughs> by Pamela or someone. All right. Moving on, we do have some recognitions we'd like to share with you today. Next, we have an operator from our contractor, Keolis, Mr. James Mauk, as he's in the audience. If we could ask him to come down. Uh, Mr. Malk, coming on down, recently displayed great passion and care for his passengers when he encountered a senior boarding his vehicle. The customer showed signs of dementia, so he called operations to have someone assist her. We learned that the customer had been lost from her senior home, and thanks to Mr. Malk, she was quickly transported back to the care of the facility. So we'd like to thank him for going above and beyond to care for our customers with special needs. I'd just like to thank the RTC and Keolis for everything, and uh, have a Merry Christmas, everybody. Thank you.
wouldn't mind standing. Our next operator recognition is from our contractor, MV Transportation. Mr. Myron Lesane recently was driving. If we could have Myron come down. We'll talk about you a little bit. Is Myron with us? Oh, good. Myron, come on down. All right. <laughs> Myron was recently driving the Charleston route when he received a notification over the bus communication system about a lost child. That same day, a young girl entered the coach that met the description. He confirmed the girl's name and quickly radioed MV to send Metro. So due to the conscientious actions taken by Mr. Lesane, he was able to assist in reuniting a child with her parents. So we want to thank you, Mr. Lesane, for your service. Um, I just want to thank everybody for this uh, recognition. Um, first and foremost, I mean, my family is the most important thing to me. Uh, my family's in the back. So that's my wife, my two daughters, and Miss Purnell. They're shy, so they're not going to stand up. And so they're saying, stand up, guys. So, um,. So when I found when I uh, found the girl on on the bus, um, I thought about my my kids, and so um, I just went into action, made it happen. And um, the lady, one lady, got off the bus and she said, "Oh, you're a hero." I said, "No." I said, "I became that girl's dad when she got on my bus." Aww. So if we all have the wow. mindset to just care and just take the the initiative to actually care for somebody, yeah. we can get a lot of things done. All right. Next, we have two recognitions for the RTC Superstar of the Quarter. Now, this valued team member spearheaded an effort to improve reliability of our buses by implementing a process to fuel them more quickly, saving time and ensuing dependable bus arrivals. When it came time to remove older buses from the operation and prepare new ones for service, he did it in a timely and efficient manner before the start of the summer. This resulted in fewer road calls due to heat-related shutdowns, fewer frustrated passengers, and cost savings to the entire agency. He is widely respected by his colleagues, always willing to spearhead new projects, and consistently contributes to building a strong team dynamic. Please join me in congratulating Roger Johnson. Well, thank you uh, very much for this uh, recognition. It's really nerve-wracking being up here <laughs> facing this direction, but I do want to try and say thank you. Um, thanks to my management for providing a work environment that um, allows you to explore your weaknesses, um, encourages your strengths, and uh, provides the uh, opportunity for growth and development. I want to thank uh, all my teammates and all my coworkers um, you know, we all have our different roles and responsibilities, but working together uh, with our experience, with our knowledge, in a creative way, um, you know, with professionalism, it uh, makes us a great team, a great department, and a great agency, and uh, it makes us even more special. So thank you. We have one more. Our second RTC Superstar of the Quarter is from our finance department. 
This recipient is both a valuable leader and team player while she goes above and beyond to assist the customer care department in ins uh, ensuring our customers' concerns are addressed quickly. She is also dedicated to reducing fare evasion and fraud, which are MJ Maynard's two things she loves to attack. So. With her initiative to monitor, track, and reduce fraud exposure on our RTC Ride app, she has been able to reduce credit card chargebacks to the RTC by approximately $20,000 per month. Her team and those she works with recognize her consistent support, leadership, and collaboration. Please help me congratulate Susan Feiner. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's uh, very nice to be nominated for this award, and I appreciate Michelle and all her leadership, as well as Sherwin and Mark and MJ. I love being on the finance team. It's a great place to be. I enjoy working for the RTC. I have the support of the management staff. Uh, they give me the tools that I need to do my job, as well as the flexibility and uh, the time to just take care of what I need to for the RTC. So I appreciate my team in finance as well as my coworkers, and it's just, it's amazing working for RTC. So thank you so much, thank appreciate you. it. Thank you very much. Last month, the Clark County, no. I'll let you all settle in. Last month, the Clark County School District Star Fair brought hundreds of students to the Mobility Training Center last month. Star stands for Students in Transition Accessing Resources. And this latest fair brought together more than 25 vendors to provide information about community resources to students who need special assistance transitioning from high school to adulthood. This is the third year that the school district has hosted the STAR Fair at our Mobility Training Center. It's clear that the community understands the importance of this event and we are happy to be able to provide a unique venue to accommodate these students. And we appreciate the efforts of the school district to continue to share this information with our constituents. Moving on, I'd like to take a few minutes this morning to uh, share some updates on several efforts we've been working on. While you're somewhat familiar with most of this work, we're excited to provide some progress reports on how we're doing things differently as we work to improve mobility in our community. As you all know, we're at a point where there is a lot of disruption and change going on in the world of transit and transportation. And I believe, and I thank your leadership in encouraging us to continue to explore, deploy, test, and learn how we can incorporate these technologies into our system so that we become more agile and efficient in delivering the services that constituents need because things are changing and just because we're government does not mean we get to just sit back and continue doing operations as we've always done them. So I'm very proud of these things. Um, I also wanna share with you that the things I will report on regularly with you, these, these changes, these innovations, we are able to do in Southern Nevada for really one and one only and one reason only, and that is because we approach things from a regional perspective and the regional collaboration that goes on between our different jurisdictions, our agencies, the Department of Transportation really is unlike several of our other peer metropolitan agencies. Generally, you will see a, the bus agency just being the bus agency, the traffic management agency just being the traffic management agencies. And they make things even worse in other areas. There are several different of these, several different bus agencies in one metropolitan area, several different traffic management agencies in one area, which makes it very difficult for them to test, deploy, um, and learn from the things that we are gonna be able to do here in Southern Nevada at an accelerated pace. So very proud to pr report to you on the things that we're working on. 
first, way the first, and we've been getting a lot of national, even global, international attention on this one. Um, the WayCare platform that we spent the past year piloting and testing. This is a collaboration between the RTC, the Department of Transportation, the Nevada Highway Patrol, and it's allowing us to share data and identify uh, and mitigate high crash hotspots around the valley in the short time that we've been working with WayCare, which by the way was a very small Israeli startup, not a large multinational firm, small, humble, hungry, agile, wanting to build something that was really gonna work and, and at a low cost. We've been able to reduce the time it takes to clear crashes by 12 minutes and reduce crashes in high incident areas by 17%. So imagine the impact, the tax, you know, the tax dollars we are saving by avoiding these incidents and accidents. And we have a clip um, from Channel 13 that highlights this. New at 6, all of these traffic cameras along with your car and your phone, they are helping make one of the busiest stretches of freeway safer. That's right, the technology is already in place on northbound 15 between Russell and Charleston, but it could be expanding across our valley. The RTC is partnering with a tech startup called Waycare, which combines information from traffic cameras, sensors, and the Waze app. When the system detects conditions that make a crash more likely, the RTC puts up a message warning drivers to slow down. NHP patrol cars then move into place to ease congestion. And the first year of the program has seen some really big results. 90% of drivers in the area will reduce their speed down to the speed limit. And in doing so, we've seen a 17% reduction in the number of crashes when we do target those hot spots. And the RTC is looking into expanding the program to the 95 near Rainbow. So very proud of that effort and we'll report uh, that that um, program is expanding. I understand the WayCare now has partnerships directly with the city of Las Vegas, with the city of Henderson, and, um, and the NDOT will be deploying them throughout the state as well. So very happy to see that system grow. And actually just yesterday we had a meeting with them in the Raiders, so yeah. Next. In September of 2016, we launched our Ride RTC app that allows customers to plan their trip, buy their pass, and find their bus. And since then, that app's been downloaded more than 206,000 times, and we've sold approximately $8 million worth of, of fare in mobile passes. And just this month, we updated the app with two new features. Transit Plus, a feature where riders can seamlessly plan, book, and pay for an Uber or Lyft ride in conjunction with the RTC Transit app. So truly being able to offer a first mile, last mile, or mobility in its entirely, connecting you from where you are to where you need to go. Transit Watch, also a safety feature where customers can directly report on any suspicious non-emergency activity uh, directly to RTC security. Uh, both have to be initially downloaded separately, but then can be directly accessed from the RTC app following their initial download. And we'll share with you a video on it. It's a new way to stay safe. Now they can tell us instantly and we can get on it a lot faster. Transit Watch will soon be a part of the Ride RTC app. Riders can file a report on their cell phones if they feel there's a security concern while on or near an RTC bus. If you want to report an incident, you would just click that button. David Swallow with RTC's engineering and technology team says it really is that simple. Just choose from a menu of potential situations. Maybe there's a fight. Maybe somebody left a bag on the bus. Type in the bus number and location and hit submit. The RTC says once you use the app to submit a safety concern, they can also immediately tap into their security cameras, which are now on every bus, to take a look at what's really going on. We can remote into the cameras on that bus in real time and then figure out if we're going to deploy our own security officers or if we're going to bring in a uh, Metropolitan Police Department to, to handle that. Protecting the public one click at a time. It's going to give us valuable information help us be a lot more responsive to our customers' concerns. Orcomana, 8 News Now. Mm -hmm. Next, we'd like to give you an update on our ride on-demand pilot for paratransit veteran and certification clients. As a reminder, paratransit service requires customers to make a reservation up to three days in advance, that's standard paratransit, and share a ride with other passengers. This program allows current participants this partnership with Lyft allows current part participants to hail a ride via Lyft or Tango car, which is for those who require mobility devices, and to get picked up within minutes. Since this program launched in February, we've seen amazing results. 195 clients have opted into the program, and those passengers have taken more than 11,000 trips on Lyft. 
And in that time frame, the RTC has recognized a 53% cost savings, or more than $231,000. And as we reported to you last month, certainly transit ridership and fares are of concern for us. So the more that we partner with private sector and optimize um, their services with ours, reducing our costs is actually absolutely imperative and important. In addition to our cost savings, the general customer feedback we've received is that it gives them the freedom they've never had before. This is the type of service we hope to continue to incorporate into our transportation options. So imagine previously having to call in three days in advance to book your ride, and now you can do it on demand, um, direct. You used to have to share a ride. In these case, this case, generally, you'll have a ride by yourself. So excited about this particip uh, par partnership with Lyft and appreciate the Lyft's cultural collaborative to really partnering with communities. Which brings us to my next and last story. Um, you may recall in October that you approved a partnership with Lyft and the Fanatics, which is located up in North Las Vegas, to help improve mobility for many workers at the local Fanatics facility. According to Aaron Hill, the company's general manager, the service has been a huge success for employee morale. More than 100 of their employees are signed up for the program and 320 rides were taken just in the first month of service. I'll share with you this story that was uh, reported on Channel 13. It highlights a couple of the individuals who are benefiting, benefiting from this partnership. And I also want to note that Aaron let us know this story is one of their most viewed pieces on their social media. And as a result, he's received requests for information from colleagues in other cities across the nation who are interested in replicating this program in their states and at their work sites. My athletes are our employees, and they're walking two and a half miles one way, five miles round trip. Well, it sounds like a tall tale your grandparents would tell, but it is the reality for some employees at a North Las Vegas warehouse. But as 13 Action News reporter Brian Callahan explains, their boss is working with the RTC and Lyft on a solution they hope will catch on with neighboring businesses. Even if these employees came to the closest bus stop to the warehouse, they still have about a two mile walk ahead of them, which could take as much as an hour to make that walk and arrive here at the warehouse already exhausted. The general manager at Fanatics didn't think it was fair that employees had to go to such lengths to get to work. He reached out to the RTC about extending bus routes, but leaders say there isn't enough demand to support the added routes. Certainly it would cost tens of thousands of dollars annually for the RTC to extend a route out to that employment center. That's when the RTC teamed up with Fanatics and Lyft to form a pilot program where employees could pick up a lift at 13 nearby bus stops that takes them to and from the warehouse. The idea is in a six month trial period with the RTC hoping to not just continue the efforts, but possibly extend it to neighboring warehouses. And we'll probably develop a, a bundled pass program that would be a monthly pass that ties in those lift rides with our transit service. And the employees say it not only takes the load off their feet and wallet, but makes them more eager to come to work each day. You have somebody that's in charge of you that care for your safety, how you get home, how you get here, that means a lot. Brian Callahan, 13 Action News. It's a great story, and it was a very difficult um, partnership to, to navigate and negotiate, so I'd like to give kudos to our Deputy General Manager, MJ Maynard, in, in navigating that whole thing, so thanks. <laughs> Next up, we had an exciting announcement this week. The, uh, we, we submitted an application in partnership with the City of Las Vegas um, to the federal government, a competitive grant program called BUILD. BUILD stands for Better Utilizing Investments to Leverage Development. It was formerly known as TIGER. Uh, you probably remember the TIGER grant competitive program. And I'm happy to announce we won. We learned on Tuesday. So yeah, we learned it's a five, over a $5 million grant. Um, and let's see, what can I tell you about it? So we were notified last week that we are the recipient. Uh, we've sub we submitted the proposal for an autonomous shuttle circulator that will connect downtown Las Vegas with the Las Vegas Medical District. Uh, the project is called GoMed. It'll demonstrate the ability to apply automated technology in a complex urban setting uh, to enhance pedestrian safety and connectivity. It will it'll be focused uh, from the Bonneville Transit Center into the medical district, which is about 680 acres, I think, of, of a medical campus. We've got four hospitals there. The system will employ four autonomous vehicles. Um, in conjunction, we'll have, we're going to have very smart bus shelters with Wi-Fi and uh, information to, to our, our users. We'll also have uh, 
pedestrian, enhanced pedestrian detection using LIDAR, and then the ability to, you will have some connected car, um, or we'll have a co connected car technology and the ability to share information with our infrastructure regarding pedestrian and vehicle activity so that we, it really is, it will be flooded with technology for the purpose of connecting people from Bonneville Transit Center to the medical district within the medical district um, and also enhancing safety. So we will be working with the FTA on this project as well as with the city of Las Vegas and um, we will be reporting to you regularly on it. And could I add something please through you, Mr. Chairman? Um, there were over 500 applicants on this grant and that the RTC city combination was one of 91, I believe, but this was something Secretary Chow in transportation, uh, really this was to be innovative and really strictly focused on the innovation and transportation. So it really is and congratulations to your entire staff and I know how hard you work to get this and what a great opportunity and, and future for the city and the medical district as well. Well, I have to tell you that one of the reasons, one of the, some of the feedback that I've gotten, the reason that they will entrust us with this particular project is because the city had already done an autonomous vehicle shuttle. They knew we already had on staff the experience and the ability to execute this. Had we never had tested, deployed, and the other technologies as well, they would have probably not have awarded to us because it, it, you, it's not a grant you would want to give to a city that had never done this work before. Yeah, it was really exciting and I know MJ and her group have to be so excited too because that was something that was remarkable, brought so many people in to ride on that cute little Navia, that was <laughs> what it was. And so just really exciting. Could I digress for one second, Mr. Please. Chairman? On that lift, um, program. Sure. I thought we had um, voted in favor of that as a pilot program, mm -hmm. which the end of the commentary suggested. When does that come back to us for um, extension? I'm, I'm going to ask Deputy General Manager to, uh, MJ Maynard to address it. There, it's a little more complicated than just that because we have to get authorization from the FTA as well. Uh -huh. So, MJ. So we've issued an RFP for a paratransit service and um, when we um, and I believe that we've extended by three months. So sometime uh, in the the end of 2019, around that time, we're gonna we'll have a new paratransit partner. Uh, the FTA agreed to let us extend the pilot program to coincide with the timing of the new paratransit partnership. <coughs> Commissioner, thank you. Just a follow up. Um, do you have the fiber? within this area, because mm -hmm. that is a problem within even the valley, let alone yeah. outside of Nevada, uh, Clark County, mm -hmm. to we, be able to do the technology? Yes, between the RTC and the city, there is a, the, the downtown innovation district has been um, is supersized as it relates to fiber and connectivity. Okay, because we're working with a variety of groups to try to bring that into our, where we Correct. Call, call food deserts, but it's actually fiber deserts now uh, around mm -hmm. the valley as far as that's concerned. Then looking as, as you're dealing with, it, the innovation concepts. Have we explored smaller buses such as this to do that residential last link as sure. well, besides just Uber and Lyft, so that there's more nimbleism within sure. the, the, the program? And I know part of it is the fare reductions are coming in or we're anticipating our budget change, but I don't want us to lose sight of accessibility for folks. So sure. it, is that something I'm that gonna, okay. I'm so going to miss you I, I, when you depart. But yes, uh, you will in 2019 be receiving um, regular reports from Deputy General Manager MJ Maynard on some of the initiatives that she has got underway and our priorities for her for next year. I'll give you my personal email so you can send it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings us to Councilwoman. Tina. Oh. Councilwoman. I, I just wanted to say it's such a great addition to the medical district also because, as you know, our district goes all the way to the Ruvo Center as well as on the further up on Charleston and um, I we sort of look at UCLA and we see how they're doing things and how they're moving people because we know how much is going to be coming to our medical district and so you can look at the fact that you're downtown downtown hotels where people might be staying and they'll be able to utilize this right to go to the hospitals and it just shows that I think we were on the cutting edge above UCLA in this one. I wanted to tell you that. Thank you. <laughs> Councilman? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Manager. That was a, uh, Madam Manager, that was a fantastic report. And again, of, of course, uh, you can't tell, but if I were a doggy, my tail would have been wagging. <laughs> uh, I, I brought the part with, uh, of course, Fanatics again, Ward 1. 
uh, we've opened up uh, several uh, of these uh, very similar uh, d uh, distribution centers. And um, uh, first of all, I want to commend uh, the RTC and the architects of these programs of coming up with innovative solutions uh, f uh, for making this happen. Uh, that's most, uh, I'm very happy because, of course, it's a fantastic amenity for, uh, for our, uh, our residents. Um, we're, at the, of course, at the uh, hard hat uh, tour for the new 2 million square foot uh, distribution center that, uh, that Amazon just came up uh, with, um, just um, in that area as well, you know, in my ward. Uh, they're supposed to have over 1,000 employees, and uh, I have a feeling that um, now, I mean, uh, I don't know if a lot of people who are here, I, I'm also a teacher, that's my, actually my first job. And um, a couple of generations ago, you know, um, the kids' second best day of their life was when they had their um, driver's license. But now um, there's a big de-emphasis uh, on, on drivers. It's, it's hard to find anywhere to, to, that, that they actually have driver education courses. And a lot of students, they're not rip-roaring or ready to actually go driving, or which is, you know, and, uh, and they're growing into adulthood. And I have a feeling that um, it is imperative for the RTC, of course, to open up new programs that are going to address, you know, the, these young adults um, that are looking at transportation in a much different way than, than we are, you know. Um, I would say that most of the people in here are probably like my age, no problem, we just go ahead and get into our car, we're gone, we're there. This, these newer generations, they're not wired like us, and they look at things totally different. That's why this, uh, th this hop-on um, self-driving shuttle uh, makes sense. I, uh, I'm a former cab driver, and of course, you know, uh, I don't know how I would feel if I was still a professional cab driver, but times are changing. Times are changing, and of course, and, and looking at different uh, uh, modes of, uh, of transportation, I'm happy to see that RTC is, is definitely looking ahead and changing with the times. And, and I'd like to also echo uh, what C Commissioner Chris G said um, regarding, you know, uh, again, exploring other uh, modes of transportation. And, you know, well, companies like uh, Amazon, it is in there also, they're in their um, express interest to make sure that their employees get there on time and be able to uh, complete shifts. So um, I'm kind of hoping that we can bring them on board uh, as a good community partner as well. Um, their success is RTCs and of course ultimately the public success. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of hoping that, you know, uh, instead of having a contentious relationship in any way, when um, and of course funds have to be, how should I say, acquired and expended, I'm, I'm kind of hoping they can be our partners in these kind of things as well. Thank you so very much for a fantastic report. Oh, thank you, Councilman. And I will assure you, and the Amazon has started conversations with MJ and her team as well. All right, and finally, for this month's general manager report, I'd sadly, but excitedly and supportively, like to bid a fond farewell to outgoing board member, Commissioner June Kiliani. I I can't remember what the RTC was like without you because I think we've been on this board together pretty much the same amount of time. She was first elected to Clark County Commission in 2007 and joined our board in 2009. I didn't become the general manager until 2012, so you've been my boss ever since I, ever since I took the position. Yeah, and so um, I want to just to have a personal note of thank you. You have always been supportive of us. You have asked really hard questions, but you've always asked questions with a purpose, never to attack, always to do what's right for our constituents, for your constituents, for the region. You have approached your role on the regional transportation commission truly as a regional representative, not just your jurisdiction. Um, and you've always looked out for me as a fellow female and you have been on the committee um, that reviews my compensation and you've always been an advocate of making sure that I was compensated um, for my performance and that um, the fact I was female was never a consideration. So thank you very much. Personally, I appreciate it. Thanks. And we do have a plaque for you. Do you mind? <laughs> can we go ahead and have you stand so our board can say goodbye to you?
some of the speakers from earlier today, the two superstars. You are very much more articulate than I'm going to be. It's been a journey. It's been an adventure. Um, my passion for travel has allowed me, I think, to bring some ideas to this board that maybe um, everyday people don't because I like to, to go to weird places and struggle without reservations on how I'm going to figure out my way around. But it also, um, this board has been, it, it's been, a, it, it's a great support group. Isaac, you're gonna, going to enjoy it immensely because it makes a difference in our constituents' lives in a completely different way that people don't normally think about. And it's been a pleasure, the team, you are a team. Um, RTC has just been delightful. When you took over the S SNS, when we you know, put that on your table, you always accept different things than people think out of the box here, which makes it exciting. So um, it's been my pleasure and honor to serve. Um, I'm, I am a public servant. It's kind of hard when one door closes, another one's going to open up is the way I, I decided to start looking at this. It's, it's hard because I just retired from the school district. I just sent my papers in on that too. So um, bittersweet. But um, I'm going to start an educational institute for leadership and civics, and so um, I'll be working with kids in a completely different way. So thank you all for working with me. I appreciate it. Your, your, your fierce and lively spirit will be greatly missed on this board, but we know that you'll continue to be a great advocate for the overlooked in our community and that you will continue to champion for all of us. So on behalf, again, of the all entire RTC. But we know you're still going to be there, and, and we will be there for you. As you go on with your new endeavors, you know you can turn to us to help educate, advocate, in whatever it, way it is as it relates to trans and transportation. Thank you for that. And Isaac's absolutely correct because I mentor kids at high school and they're not getting their driver's licenses. Mm -hmm. They have a different view of the world of how to get there. We need to still make sure that we have sidewalks though um, <laughs> because, <laughs> because a lot of these moms and dads walk their kids to school and we don't have that interconnectivity. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Mobility is more than just getting in a bus or a car. So um, that's what I've always been excited about is how we all, you all come up with different ideas of, of ways to approach and fill those gaps that are there. So thank you. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank you for your leadership over many, many years. I, I remember my father worked with you and he's been gone for 15 years and he worked with you when you were a, a school teacher and, and appreciated your passion and advocacy and leadership. And, and you've, been a, you've been an example to all of us and you've asked tough questions and you've always stood for what's right for our communities and, and I appreciate your, your leadership and you're, you truly are an example to others and so thank you very much. I just want to say I, I met Chris uh, primarily because of the interest in education and I immediately admired her very, very much hard working ethic, extreme intelligence, not afraid to stand up to the artillery flying around. <laughs> and you know, you don't always agree with Chris, but that's what it's like when we have uh, diversity and that's what learning is all about. And uh, I, I know that I learned a lot from her. And of course, we've had this great interest in helping those with disabilities and their families. Um, I just wanted to say how much I've admired her all these years. And um, you don't find people very often in public service who uh, have the guts to stand up when it takes time to stand up and there's not many around you. I'm just saying that. Mm -hmm. And I think we all know that up here. Uh, so you did do that, Chris. And um, I want to tell you how much I appreciate it. And as so many people I know have appreciated it also. And of course, I get to say goodbye to you a couple times next week also, but um, it, as far as this board, um, and part of the reason this board's so successful is to a person, uh, not only do we stay up and stay involved, but we care. And I think, Chris, that's, out of your many fine qualities, I think that's one of your finest, that you truly care about what you do, the constituents you represent, the issues that you're passionate about, uh, that sincerity is is so lacking in our community today, and uh, I think that's what you've brought to this table, this board, and, and this community, and I thank you for that. 
<laughs> bottom. <laughs> Let me chime in too. <laughs> I've I've had the p pleasure of serving with with Chris not only here but on the health district board and um, for many years and admired her for for years before that before I was a uh, public servant myself but uh, one thing I'll definitely say about Chris um, is that I, I don't think I've ever met anybody uh, in public service that does her does homework better than she does she's always so prepared um, coming to, to, to bring to bear just experience and knowledge and reviewing the materials and asking the right questions and um, that's that's a great trait to have um, because we have so much information that floods our way and uh, somehow she seems to get through all of it and, uh, and um, that's fantastic. And she's also a tremendous advocate for people that really don't have a voice. Uh, I found that over the years with her that uh, she gives a voice to them. And um, I appreciate that. You know, when it, one day I'm going to go to the pearly gates and um, the judgment bar and try to explain, you know, why I should get into heaven. And I want her on my team. I want her to be my <laughs> advocate there to, to, to fight for me because she's that kind of a person. And uh, I'm glad that you're not uh, hanging up the spikes forever, that you're going to keep going. And I'm sure you'll be continue to be involved in public service. But we so much appreciate your service over the years. Thank you. And I will, um, just so that everybody that's here or wherever you are, we um, gave Chris a, pro a day, a proclamation giving the city, um, Chris Giunchiliani Day in the city of Las Vegas. And so having admired her for many years and knowing that she worked previously with my husband on different committees as well, I think we echo what's been said, but uh, you know, to me, I think the most important thing is the integrity of who you are. And uh, no matter what, and uh, Mayor Pro Tem Tarkanian down there, um, I know you and I too have been on different sides of different issues, but I always had the highest regard for your, your thoroughness uh, of investigation of everything, but more importantly, your deep caring about each individual. Uh, you really are uh, quite a remarkable servant of the public all those years in Carson City um, and not frightened. You've never been frightened to speak out or take on a, a difficult task. Two, you put your nose in a lot of other people's business. <laughs> <laughs> which I just love. <laughs> so um, my, my greatest uh, wish for you is um, I know we will see lots of you. You will be involved. You will be in leadership. Um, and I call you a friend. I think uh, all I can tell you is to trust people first for their truth and e efficacy. Um, and admire their commitment to what they're supposed to be doing, not cutting corners, not doing it out of self-aggrandizement, me, I, my, it is about me. With Chris, it's always been about what can she do for the greater good. So um, I hadn't spoken up before because I know I will be on other committees with you where you are stepping down, so you'll hear another commentary, but always the truth because you're quite a lady, quite a lady. So thank you. Thank you. All right, before we see any tears from her, let's move on real quick. So uh, item number four is to receive the Nevada Department of Transportation Director's Report from our director, Mr. Rudy Malthabon. Thank you, Tina. Uh, wanted to join in with wishing Commissioner June Kiyon. No, it's June too late, Kiliani. you missed that. Chris G, the no. best. <laughs> no wonder they say Chris G, <laughs> June Kiliani. But uh, I always appreciated the, the fact that you were so well prepared just as Mayor Woodbury said, um, just drawing on your legislative experience and knowing all the details, the ins and outs of the issues, and just how you would fight for the, the little person that needed that effort, needed government to represent them and do the right thing. Um, recently, I was asked a question from our staff about um, the Nellis Boulevard project, and we have um, a kind of a rehab project and ADA improvements that we're doing in the valley, and that's just an example. But in, um, the intersection, there was a concrete intersection on that project and they asked, should we just stay within our right way? No, you do the right thing and, and fix the whole intersection. And I think that that's kind of you rubbing off on us to, to teach us to do the right thing as public agencies and, and care about 
the end result and, and what we're here for to serve the public. Um, so I wish you the best and I'm glad to hear that you're still going to be working. Uh, currently we're operating under a temporary extension. Um, you heard probably the president's comments this week about <laughs> government shutdowns and while we're concerned about that, we still have a substantial amount of money in our state highway fund to, to cover our obligations. Uh, obviously, we hope that this doesn't um, force us to, to get drastic on any cuts, but we are concerned about this talk about a government shutdown. One of the things that's not l known very well is if the, if the federal government ceases to collect their fed federal fuel taxes, there's a state law that says that the state will continue to collect those taxes so we don't uh, miss any revenue that we're supposed to receive in the event of a shutdown. Um, just uh, recently we ha had a public information meeting on the I-15 North and 215 Beltway interchange. Uh, the public comment period is, is open till the 21st of this month, but uh, we expect the design to be completed on that interchange uh, next year and the construction will start in the fourth quarter of next year. It's a substantial project and it's kind of in line with what we're doing with trying to address all the system to system interchanges with the Beltway and I-15 or US-95. Um, we're working with uh, on the memorandum of understanding still with uh, Brightline, which is now aligned with uh, Richard Branson's company, Virgin Rail, is what the new brand is going to be called. Basically, they bought the Express West project and they're going to uh, be looking at advancing that and attracting an investment to build that high-speed rail project um, down I-15. And with Ivanpah being in the mix, uh, as announced by the airport, recon, um, looking at opening that back up as an environmental study for uh, a new airport down uh, south of us, the, um, we're reopening our uh, south I-15 environmental uh, study. Uh, that study went down to Sloan, but we're looking at all the way down to Ivanpah now and seeing if uh, what impacts it has from the rail project as well as the, the new airport. Um, I'm going to have to be leaving to go celebrate the completion of the Garnet Interchange project on I-15 at US-93. Um, on that project, we also widened a portion of US-93 by the Apex Industrial Park. And um, that's uh, a groundbreaking event. I'll see Mayor Lee out there from North Las Vegas. Uh, really pleased with Ames Construction, our contractor on that design build effort. Um, and I also wanted to congratulate uh, Tina and, and the City of Las Vegas on that grant. It, it was very competitive. Um, there weren't, uh, I think that was about uh, nine, nine to one uh, as far as the amount of money that was requested. Um, there was a billion and a half uh, available, but it was a, a good win for Nevada and for this region to, to get that project and apply that technology and, and see how that works for the medical district uh, to downtown. Um, that I, I hear that uh, Secretary Chow from the USDOT is going to be here at, at the Consumer Electronics Show, and she'll probably speak about that award of that project as well. With that, that concludes the uh, director's report for NDOT, and I'm willing to answer any questions. Comments or questions for Rudy? Councilman, are you heading up to the Garnet groundbreaking? <laughs> you show up to our meeting, yeah, and I you get an I'll interchange. <laughs> Six million dollars at flood control. <laughs> yeah. You're like the rainmaker. Um, yeah, actually, um, the Interstate 15 North project that's in North Las Vegas Ward One, and the Garnet Valley Interchange, uh, also in North Las Vegas Ward One. Right. Uh, now, uh, all all levity aside, uh, all, all levity aside, um, I'm really happy uh, to to hear that uh, my city has been able to partner with our regional partners. With our RTC, with NDOT, and of course uh, with, with, the, with our other various uh, uh, um, agencies, uh, the city of Las Vegas, Clark County, uh, it's really important. Um, we're not sure what's going to happen here. Um, interest rates, we're not sure if they're going to go up to stabilize our economy. Here's the uh, social studies teacher in me, the economist, okay? We know that things go up in cycles and down in cycles. I'm not trying to uh, rain on anyone's parade here. The last recession, all I know is this. When I was actually uh, five years ago, um, six, six years ago, when I was actually uh, campaigning for this position, um, the thing that struck my mind is when I was uh, canvassing my neighborhood there in my ward, the place where I grew up, the place where I represent now, um, easily a third of the houses were empty. 
North Las Vegas, especially 89030, was in the top three for the hardest hit regions of the country when, when it came to, uh, when, when it came to um, foreclosures. And what that means is it's, it's more than just, you know, uh, not having taxes uh, come into your, to your, to your uh, region, to, to your city. What it represents is uh, broken dreams. People's dreams are gone, destroyed. Um, what we try to do in North Las Vegas, uh, and, and again, we're very happy that we have partners that share in our vision, is do everything that we can to diversify um, the uh, economy of Southern Nevada. Uh, but that means um, bringing infrastructure into, uh, one of the major assets that North Las Vegas has is open land and access along I-15 and the railroad. That's a, it, it's a huge asset. And what we try to do is open up those, uh, uh, that, that land for investment. And we're seeing this investment happen. And we can only have the, uh, these things uh, to try to proof us as much as we can. Gaming's gonna be the, uh, the, found, the foundation of this valley probably forever until we no longer have a society, I think. But as, uh, it, it's, it's really incumbent, um, it's our responsibility to do everything that we can to open up uh, other um, phases of the economy, other parts of the other uh, uh, facets of the economy. And we're doing this with your help, with the, with the help of the RTC. And um, I'm, I'm happy that, uh, I think we'll be better, a little bit better prepared uh, for anything else that happens. And again, um, it's gonna be good to, uh, to, to see you out there at Garnet. And um, he's always hoping for everybody to, uh, for, for a great future here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rudy. Travel safely, enjoy the holidays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Next is to, is your consent, a giant, a consent agenda, which is made up of items five through 53. Uh, we would like to pull item number nine. Oh, okay. Motion on the floor, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed. Thank you. Motion Item carries. number 54 is to receive an update on Southern Nevada Strong and on the internal strategy for administration of the Southern Nevada Strong Regional Plan. And starting the items, Dr. Fred, you wanna do the introductions on that? We have with us today, uh, Ms. Ray Lathrop, the manager of SNS and Miles Dixon with the J. Barrett Company to give a presentation. Good morning, commissioners. Um, my name is Ray Latrop. I'm the manager of regional planning for the Southern Nevada Strong Department. Um, let's make sure this works. Great. Um, this year, the Southern Nevada Strong Implementation Office, housed here at the RTC, adopted three strategic goals to help guide and measure our work moving forward. Those goals are to administer the Southern Nevada Strong Regional Plan and champion its implementation and engage the public. Also to partner with stakeholders to implement that regional plan and also encourage regional collaboration and leadership. Today I'm gonna to share some updates and accomplishments on projects centered around these goals and then we'll talk a little bit about these goals. These items are very, very high level. Uh, we'll be publishing an annual report and we look forward to sharing that with you in the new year. Okay. So first, a few updates related to the first goal of administering, championing, and engaging. As you may know, Medicaid is one of the largest resources for healthcare in the state. SNS took a leadership role in helping local organizations learn how to better access Medicaid programs and funding in an effort to connect our stakeholders with new resources. We convened a medical program opportunities forum for local organizations to learn how they can maximize Medicaid as a revenue for medical and social services. Excitingly, over 85 individuals attend our event, and as a result, we have at least two local nonprofits working closely with the state Medicaid office to develop new or expanding existing mental health programs for their clients. Uh, we really look forward to continuing to work with our partners around this opportunity. Next, um, yeah. uh, there's a new federal tax program, which is a high priority for all of our regional partners because it incentivizes development and investment in needed 
neighborhoods, just like the SNS Opportunity Sites. Uh, in order to promote this program, we helped organize a conference called Understanding Opportunity Zones in Nevada. Um, this was for local governments, developers, investors, and community organizations to learn more about the program. And we had over 350 attendees. Next, we'll be looking, working very closely with the organizing partners, uh, which are leading this effort locally to identify future support and services that SNS can offer. And lastly, in this first goal, throughout 2018, uh, we identified uh, that competing for federal funding to support implementation of the regional plan as a big priority for our team and our partners. Uh, we organized and hosted a four-part workshop series aimed at better equipping nonprofits to secure federal grants. And over these four workshops, we had 236 total attendees, and we recruited over 20 local and state experts to, to discuss experiences and insights on grant competitiveness. After speaking with partners and stakeholders about this issue and additional needs, uh, we will hold more workshops about funding in specific areas like housing in 2019. Our second newly adopted goal is to partner with stakeholders and our community organizations to support implementation of the regional plan. It's no secret that affordable housing is a current issue within our community. Uh, housing has always been a priority for Southern Nevada Strong. So this past year, we've been a founding member of the Nevada Housing Coalition, a group of about 20 nonprofit uh, private developers, local governments, and banks working to preserve and increase affordable housing in our community. As a member of the group's steering committee, we are supporting the coalition with staff resources, um, including research, at the same time that we're helping the group define its goals that are consistent with the regional plan. Another priority for the region um, and an important issue uh, for our partners pertains to the food system, food access, and urban agriculture. Because of this, SNS continues to play an active role in the Southern Nevada Food Council, which includes at least 15 member organizations, including local governments, UNR Cooperative Extension, and local nonprofits. SNS involvement in the Food Council ensures that the group advances regional plan strategies, while we also assist with research uh, pertaining to food access, like where grocery stores are located along transit routes. Over the last few months, SNS has also met with each regional partner and steering committee members individually. Uh, we heard from all members about their current activities and priorities. From these meetings, we've been crafting a work plan for 2019 with partnership activities around housing, economic development, and health. And we look forward to bringing you this work plan in the new year. And now, to share a little bit about these goals, um, we have developed a new, um, excuse me, a new development with the SNS uh, department has been the creation and execution of a strategic plan, which establishes the SNS's office mission and provides a more focused framework on how we organize the work ahead of us. The strategic plan does not replace the regional plan. It complements it by identify, identifying SNS's ongoing role in administration and implementation. The team and the agency will use the strategic plan internally to coordinate, guide, and prioritize work, and externally to better communicate SNS's vision, work, and progress. Here to share this framework is Miles Dixon from the J.A. Barrett Company, who helped develop this new strategic plan. Hello, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Miles Dixon with the J.A. Barrett Company, and our firm had the pleasure of working with the team uh, at SNS and more broadly at the RTC to develop the strategic plan. Um, before I jump into it, I just want to say, Commissioner, it's a particular pleasure to be presenting SNS. And before you today, I know what a we know what a champion you have been for regional work um, and Southern Nevada Strong. So. It's a particular pleasure today to be in front of you. Thanks. Um, so like Ray said, the team has been working on putting together a strategic plan that was really called for by the regional plan itself. Um, what we have done is really uh, put together a strategic plan that covers a breadth of functions from things that are administrative in nature to things that are more around promoting the plan, promoting participation in the plan, 
all the way up through finding ways to proactively engage partners throughout the region to implement the plan. We'll get into some of the specifics in a moment. I do want to just flag in your backup material, you have the full strategic plan. It's very comprehensive in nature. For every goal, we've talked about objectives, tactics, as well as key measurement opportunities for its implementation. Those ideas were based on what was in the regional plan, as well as the great contributions the team in the SNS office and the RTC, as well as the many regional partners who got briefed on this in advance contributed. So I would just flag that um, Ray and the team um, throughout October and September, as you saw, met with each regional partner, as well as the other organizations that represented on the SNS steering committee, almost 18 in total, to preview this plan let them know what they were hoping to support them in doing in 2019 and invite specific feedback, both in terms of how they can be helpful um, in terms of administering, as well as really partnering with the organization. So jumping in to goal one. Sorry, am I supposed to keep going? Oh, perfect. When it moves itself, one less thing for me to think about. Okay, so goal one. Um, this is really the administrative function. Um, this is the thing that, if you will, was really handed off to the RTC a few years back. This includes everything from uh, simply in maintaining and updating the regional plan to promoting it, to working to uh, garner support and really participation from regional partners and all the other organizations that were named in the implementation matrix. It also includes tactics and objectives around measuring, tracking, and reporting on implementation of the plan itself. In goal two, the team really moves into a more proactive place, looking for opportunities as well as creating opportunities um, to work with partners, regional partners, other stakeholders, again, all of those folks mentioned in the strategic implementation matrix, to really find ways to implement the plan every day. This work really ranges from convening and facilitating that first item you see, um, so partnering with and serving as a forum for regionally significant discussions, all the way up through really supporting regional partners as they do their work. So the sort of stuff that Ray just mentioned with the Southern Nevada Food Council or the Housing Coalition. So taking staff resources, providing it in kind to partners who are really organizing, have a clear sense of what they want to achieve, and SNS can stand either alongside them or for that matter behind them, providing additional resources, providing research, and really reminding them of what the regional plan recommends. And of course, you all know that the regional plan is based on input from the community. So it's a really wonderful way for SNS office to continue to bring community input into the things that are happening in our region every day. The final one there is really seeing an opportunity that on behalf of the region, the Southern Nevada Strong Office can actually lead high impact initiatives. So places where there might be great opportunity but not a natural leader for work, SNS might be able to step in either on a short term or even a long term basis and help stand up efforts that matter to the whole region. Goal three, the final goal, really looks towards the future and I think in many ways probably puts that idea of standing up regionally important work and building coalitions and collaboration on steroids, if you will. So the sorts of ideas that many of you have talked about, the sorts of ideas that the regional plan contemplates will require a level of regional collaboration, coordination, and really vision um, that is forward looking. And so over time, certainly over the next two to three years, the SNS office is gonna be working with partners, each of your jurisdictions, your agencies, as well as so many other stakeholders in the community to find the opportunities that they can help stand up regionally significant work that's contemplated in the plan. So again, I direct you to the backup. You have a really comprehensive strategic plan, but we wanted to keep it really high level. And so at this time, we'll wrap up and see if you have any questions or comments. Questions, Mayor? Thank you very much, and thank you for this presentation. We appreciate the important work that SNS is doing and also the, the Barrett companies and, and what they're doing as well to support the SNS effort. You know, we, we're seeing, as you said, standing up to issues that need to be addressed, and sometimes someone has to get out in front, and it's a good place for SNS to really serve on a regional basis to get out in front of issues. Well, one of the things that I've discovered as we've gone along is that 
we on the RTC board know what SNS is doing, but very often in our own communities, the leaders on our own councils and commissions don't understand fully the, the depth of what's occurring and the things that you're doing and the important work that's being put forward and the changes that are really coming in our community as a result of this joint regional commitment and investment. And so I'd like to encourage the SNS uh, going forward on a quarterly basis to visit each of the city councils and the county commission and give them an update on the important work that's being done so that everyone understands the what's happening regionally and that you know there there are other regional bodies that may be impacted in some capacity whether it's the health district or whether it's uh, uh, SNRPC or other boards and commissions that are being touched by the important work that that's being done by SNS and I think that it will raise all of us up and it will allow all of us to understand the importance of this regional cooperation and why we work together and that our residents do lead regional lives and that we impact folks across our community by decisions that we make in our communities. So I appreciate what you're doing and I, I, I hope that you will uh, make it a point to reach out to each of the councils and commissions and, and having conversations and going in on a quarterly basis to make presentations. So noted. Thank, Thank you. you. Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Miles, for your words. And Ray, good to see you. Um, this has been an exciting adventure, I think, actually, with Southern Nevada Strong, starting out with Lisa Corrado back when Henderson, when we first started working on what do we want to be and looking at how we wrapped around the MPO so we weren't duplicating things. So one suggestion, um, Bill Marion, and just dawned on me sitting out there, that the SNRPC has been going through what do they want to be. And so we thought they were going to disband, but they actually sort of want to keep involved as a more taking on emerging issues. So maybe working with that group, if that's the direction they decide to be in, so that they're wrapped around, because housing was a very key issue for them and a few other things. Um, I do agree with um, um, Councilman Barone. I just rewatched The Big Short, and if you haven't seen that, it's coming back again, ladies and gentlemen, um, in this community, the whole housing issues, redlining, redistricting, um, block busting, it's all there again, and we're, it, they may not call it a subprime loan, but something's happening out there in the housing market, and we have to be very, very cautious and, com and careful, because it was the American dream is to own your own home, and um, they led people down the wrong path. So I hope as you look at the issue of the housing that were, I know that uh, I heard Arnie Stalk on the radio the other day, and they're looking at the container component. We need transitional housing, we need stabilized housing, we need mixed use housing. So part of it is as we do our zoning, we have to be a little bit more cautious about just because they wanna build it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right project for an area. And I think back to the old Spring Mountain original plan, and it had apartments, it had condos, it had, it had aging in place, aging out of place. There was a, a mix of development and we haven't had any of those really affordable um, step in, step out, because as our aging population, you may need a smaller place and you might need something without stairs. So I think we've got to be sensitive as, as zoning directors, so to speak, within our each jurisdiction of what projects are really coming forward and saying, sorry, not going there. I mean, I got shut down for wanting to actually look at making yards, backyards actually larger so that families could actually play in them. And you know the home building said, "Oh, he heck no!" <laughs> before we even had a meeting. I, I think quality of life has to be part of it. So I think Southern Nevada Strong could help us drive that conversation with the various groups because of, of the data gathering that you have. So I do think um, Commissioner uh, or Mayor um, is quite quite right, bringing everybody up to date. But I would wrap around with the regional planning in case they do stay in play so that there's a purpose for them to be able to actually work with you on that part of it. But it's been exciting to work with you all. Thank you. Thank you Hold on for a sec. I'm going to lose a quorum. So if I could trail this item, do we need a vote on the audit? So if we could, uh, and the audit, we're going to take all three items at the same. I'm going to lose my quorum at 1030. So if we could trail this item okay. and bring it back. Yes. And then bring forth the audit items. Yes. Can okay. Go okay, ahead. so uh, Chairman Brown. Have a seat. Stay with us, please. <laughs> so uh, I'll ask, uh, Kathy Lai uh, is the representative from Crow, who is our certified public accountant auditing firm. 
they performed all three audits. The audit was for the, the financial audit for the fiscal year 2018, the single audit compliance procedures for fiscal year 18, and also the auditing procedures for the appropriate and authorized expenditure of fuel revenue indexing. They performed all three audits, and she's here to present to you. Thank you, MJ. Uh, you good morning. My before name we start, so would you read those three items yes. in, into the record as yes, one? Yes, I sure will. So. Uh, Agenda item 55 is to receive the fiscal year 2018 audited financial statements. Agenda item 56 is to receive the fiscal year 2018 single audit compliance report. And agenda item 57 is to receive a report for the audit procedures performed on fuel revenue indexing for fiscal year 2018. And you can take all those in one motion after Capuli presents to you. Thank you. Please. Sure. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, on behalf of Crow, we're very grateful for this opportunity to serve as your external auditors. Uh, before I begin, I just would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge briefly my own engagement team from Crow, Rachel Adoba and Erica Alvarez, and then likewise the finance uh, team as well as executive leadership for all of their cooperation, um, Mark Trosdale, as well as Sharon Gutierrez and the finance team. Um, just a moment here to just speak briefly with respect to Crow's uh, engagement with transportation, just nationwide. We're a top 10 public accounting firm and we have a very firm commitment to the public transit space. In fact, out of the top 20 uh, different transit agencies across the country, we work with, very, with many of them, not only from an audit perspective, but from a consulting point of view and, and otherwise. And so with that, when we uh, approach clients like RTC, it's wonderful to hear your programs that you're doing and seeing and comparing and contrasting them to many of our other very large uh, transit agencies. And if you'll indulge me for just a moment, a couple of things from a finance point of view that I feel like are um, quite unique to your region and I think truly a model for others that we share with our other clients. For example, um, your mobility transit center. You know, it, it, that is truly unique. I'm not sure if you recognize that uh, just where you are, but um, this notion of being able to look at paratransit and finding those that are eligible and seeing if, that you, if they can convert that um, to fixed route and that not only being cost effective for your entity, but then also for the respective rider, I think is just remarkable and something that we just don't certainly see. Um, and I love seeing that you've integrated this this space with the school districts because I can attest with even my own audit team that there is a shift in the, in the view of mobility. They're very excited about auditing transportation entities. Um, another just comment with respect to how you compare and contrast to others, and perhaps the best testament of that is your new grant, or your, your new Tiger, or now called the BUILD grant. Um, from a federal compliance perspective, you expend over $100 million in federal expenditures every year. And with that comes a certain responsibility from a federal compliance and monitoring and, and ensuring proper reporting. And I have been so impressed with the capital management um, processes here at RTC. I mean, you literally can open a grant, buy buses, and close them within record time in comparison to my other clients. So I just hopefully you find that helpful from a perspective as we audit other transportation entities before I dive into the results here. So moving along, um, as MJ mentioned, this is a report over RTC's basic financial statements as well as some agreed upon procedures that we performed uh, with respect to the FTA as noted by the National Transit Database as well as the fuel tax indexing revenues and expenditures. Also, as I mentioned, because you're a recipient of those federal grants, we do audit um, what's called a single audit, which is an audit of all of your federal programs. I'm pleased to report uh, with respect to the financial statements that we have issued what's called an unmodified opinion, which in other uh, terms is a clean opinion. That means that the uh, financial report is materially correct in accordance with what we call as generally accepted accounting principles. Um, that is certainly not uh, an easy task to achieve, and so you, that's something to definitely commend the organization about. Um, we did, for our federal grants audit, we did not have any internal control or compliance findings. And then specific to the agreed upon procedures related to the fuel tax indexing revenues and expenditures, we did not note any significant exceptions that we feel that we needed to report to you. Um, however, during our audit of the financial statements, we did have two recommendations that we wanted to share. And again, these are very common uh, with respect to our other public transportation clients. 
We believe these are very easy for management to correct and hopefully they view these recommendations as a help meet to the organization to just strengthen internal controls. One area was in relation to the preparation of what's called the schedule of expenditures of federal awards, which is the um, schedule that we receive at the onset of your federal grant <coughs> audit that lists all of the f different federal grants and has appropriate indexing numbers or library catalog numbers if you want to uh, refer to it as that. Um, upon a initial receipt, we noted a, a, a mistake with respect to not noting the correct CFDA number or catalog number um, in accordance with the grant agreement. So we quickly pointed that out to management. They appreciated that comment and now they have implemented internal controls to strengthen the cross-referencing of all of your federal grants um, to the underlying grant award documents so we don't have this issue in the, in the future. Um, the second recommendation, now each year as an auditor it's incumbent upon me to decide which areas we want to take a look at. And in this day and age, from a, a reliance on IT systems, we felt it was um, incumbent to take a deeper dive um, in looking at the system access and the security of your respective systems. And we did have one recommendation that, again, is very common with many of our governments. It essentially is to segregate the functions for those that have what's called administrative access to financial systems or otherwise. That basically means that this person can assign user rights and access to different applications. You want to segregate that function from those that are in the normal operational environment within the finance department, just so that you can have those segregation of duties. And sometimes for entities, it's not always possible to segregate. And so in, the, in, in that instance, because of the need from an operational perspective, we would recommend additional internal controls <coughs> such that if they need to retain that type of access for those functions are not segregated, that those are monitored regularly. So we made it that recommendation uh, to management. Again, they, they removed the super user access, as we'll call it, uh, for one individual and for the, the other individual because they needed to retain that. They uh, implemented internal controls to monitor that. Anytime there's an actual change to somebody's user rights that's instituted by this individual, somebody else is al already reviewing that. Um, so with that, those are our recommendations. There's a few required communications based on my auditing standards that I must make. Uh, for example, uh, Crow is independent of your entity under government auditing standards. Um, with respect to significant accounting transactions, as you look through your financial statements, you'll notice that it may have lengthened in terms of disclosures. That's because there's a new accounting standard um, similar to the pension accounting standard. It's called OPEB, so Other Post-Employment Benefits, which is really post-retirement health care benefits. That standard, GASB 75, um, requires the entity re to record a long-term liability on your financial statements as well as an enhanced disclosure surrounding all of the estimates that um, go into that respective liability. With respect to the disclosures, as I've reviewed those as well as management's judgments of rega regarding accounting estimates, we do believe that the disclosures are neutral, consistent, and clear, um, and again, believe that there's no issues there. Uh, we did not uh, find any material corrected or uncorrected misstatements. And then in terms of any difficulties encountered during the audit, for instance, if we had a disagreement with management related to an accounting area, or if we were aware that management was consulting with another accounting firm to try to get a second opinion, we would have to disclose to you. I'm pleased to report that we did not have any of those instances during our audit. So with that, I'll conclude my presentation and happy to address any questions. Thank you. Comments or questions? Commissioner. Thank you. That's one of the best ones I've heard. Your enthusiasm for numbers <laughs> is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the two issues were accepted by management. I've read in the backup. Nothing on the fuel revenue index tax at this point. No, um, yeah, but, but part of the agreed upon procedures was for us to look at the internal controls, to trace transactions to the general ledger, to look to ensure that all the bond payments that were made, and we did not have any exceptions noted. Excellent. And I think down the road, as we look at mix of revenue, we need to be sensitive. That's working but we still have some legislative issues on whether or not autonomous vehicles have to pay something, electric cars have to pay something, they're still mm -hmm. on our roadways, so I believe without discouraging them, there should be. But it's making sure that the controls are in place so we can prove out that the projects actually were done with the money that was collected. So I think that's a good news piece for the constituents in the long run, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would move to uh, receive and accept the reports from the audit company. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. 
And with that, did we want to go back to the previous agenda item? Okay. So we'll bring back item number 54, Miles and Ray, if we could have you address the chairs. Uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, uh, I need to leave with the mayor. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, I'm going to someplace named after Chris's husband, if you want to know the truth. Oh. So, yeah. Yes, I, it's, uh, I, it's something, it's my last one I'll be attending with him, so I need to be there. I just wanted to say something, if I could. We talk about affordable housing, and, and it, it is important. And in fact, on our problems with short-term rentals, uh, going throughout the whole country, one of the things it has done and why some people are leaving short-term rentals. <laughs> they're looking for me. <laughs> I just want to talk, Kim, the, the mayor is going to bring me there. He'll bring me into the park. Bye. Sorry, just too many things to do at one time. I just want to say, however, I have a big question about our senior housing. You know, we have different people who do things. I'll meet you in the front desk. I have many senior homes in the ward I represent, and they're operated by different operators. I have some that are not operated well. And um, um, usually that falls under HUD. And last year, we were at the top of the list to get our uh, senior home replaced, and uh, we lost out. I don't know, somebody from Henderson gave us a push out. I might have been political or not, I don't know, over there down the line. Uh, down, you down the line, I'm talking, of, no, no, you, Deborah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, they got it. But what I want to say is this. I have holes in the ceilings there. I have water that drops down onto the seniors. I have heat that doesn't work in the winter, and there's air conditioners that don't work in the summer, and then they try and put fans in, and then they don't work. I go to HUD, and I ask them, what is this? You know, you can't live in this condition. We couldn't even have our holiday dinner there because we were afraid there was mold in the kitchen. Everybody says, oh, that should have been torn down two years ago. That's what HUD tells me. That should have been torn down two years ago. Why is it still existing? Why do I go there and see holes in the ceiling? Why do I walk into their little room where they do work and I have water dripping on me? Because, well, it needs to be fixed, but it's not being fixed. And those seniors are living in horrible conditions right now. Uh, I, I'm gonna be seeing them again this week. I don't know if anything's been done because I've been complaining a lot about this. When I go to HUD, I'm told, no money. That's all I'm told, no money. And I said, well, what are you going to do? Well, maybe next year we'll be at the top of the list and maybe they'll rebuild. And what happens when you rebuild? What happens to these people in the meantime while you're taking a year to rebuild? Where do they go? These people are veterans. These people are teachers who are retired. These people deserve to be treated correctly. And to me, this is something we need to do, and I hope Nevada Strong can help. And I wish, I'm not blaming Nevada Strong. I think you do a lot of good work. I'm just saying, can you encompass some of this too? Because I'm calling the guy who's in charge, what's his name, he ran for president. I met him personally, and he told me all these great stories about his family and everything, and I'm gonna tell him his parents would not have approved of what he's doing right now. I really, and people laugh at me, I'll reach him eventually, I'll reach him. But what I'm saying is, these are people who have given of their lives. Most of them have you know, done a really good job as citizens, and they're not living in good conditions. Now, of course, they cover it up some when people, they know people are coming. But when we're there, we see it all, and they can't cover up all those holes in the ceiling, so they might all still be there. I just wanted to make that comment. It's just, to me, so important, and I think it's something that from the heart, we should try and help these people. So I'm asking if you might encompass that. Maybe give me a call sometime and I could tell you what we've tried to do. Maybe you can tell me someplace else to go to get help. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I have to leave. No, thank right you, now. Councilwoman. You, you better get outside. That, that driver of yours may leave without you. What was that? My driver's The leaving? driver may leave without you. You've been Okay, she may do that too. But anyway, I want to say happy Christmas to everybody. <laughs> I know you all work hard, and I hope we can all work together to get even more done. Mr. Thank Chair, you. as she leaves, I would suggest, Ray, that maybe we reach out to the Housing Authority because that may be some component that's a thread there. It was Ben Carson you're trying to reach, but not, yeah. Um, good luck with that. But anyway, <laughs> um, I think the Housing Authority may be able to help, but I would be turning it into code. I had to do that with the, the old trailer parks because they were not mobile homes. 
years ago in the city of Las Vegas because the conditions were so horrific. And we made the property owner actually have to house everybody in other housing until they, well, they wound up tearing all the projects down or the, the property down. So there may be some other things that we could take a look at that haven't been explored because no one should have to live in those kind of conditions. And I still remember there were holes in the floor. The, the dirt was the, actually the, the ground floor. That I, I recently, last year, had an apartment complex in my district that had no hot water for six months. Nobody should ever have to go through that and why they never called, but they have their water now. But we don't have a habitability on our statutes nor in our ordinances. I was checking cities and, and counties. And it's probably time to look at a hab habitability. We don't require at least a certain temperature for air conditioning. We live in Vegas when it hits 120 um, for, for heat and air conditioning, water temp. So that might be something that Southern Nevada Strong could help and then we could guide our own councils and commissions with at least getting that on our books so the building departments have something, some teeth in them in the long run. I've been working on that with Jerry Stevie here and I think he's got something close. Thank you. Good to have you back. <laughs> and we have nothing further. <laughs> are, you, are you done, done? We are. Okay. Where'd that order come from? All right. Do we need action on that to accept the report? No, no action. Great. Your final citizen's participation. Thank you. This is the second time set aside for public comment. Those wishing to speak to the board. Stephanie, you're number one today. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Stephanie Versnick, and I'm speaking before you for the 13th time. Each time I've testified, my message has been the same. Restore the service area to the way it was in 2011. I live a half a mile outside of the service area. This commission is familiar with my situation, as, I've, as I have talked about it for the last 13 times. The peer study review that was conducted by Dr. Montero and presented in October. In my opinion, I feel that it did not address the unique needs of this community. We are one of the fastest growing cities in the country and our growth is increasing every month. The report shows other cities meeting the minimum three quarters of a mile ADA requirement. <laughs> We don't have to follow that suit. For years, we were going above and beyond the ADA requirements, serving this community by going one and a half miles outside the service area, giving more people their independence. Why can't we be a role model for other cities by going back to one and a half miles outside the service area? Why don't we set the bar high instead of just meeting the requirement Let's meet the needs of this community. I would like to know what this commission's feedback and viewpoint is on this peer review study. Where do we go from here? This needs to be fixed. When are we going to fix it and do the right thing for this community? I'm not only speaking for my son, but for all the other individuals that are not receiving transportation they deserve. As you go into this holiday season, spending time celebrating and making lasting memories with your family and friends, think about how many people you have isolated that are not able to be with their family or friends over the holidays because they have no transportation. In closing, the Americans with Disabilities Act was designed to protect the rights of people with disabilities to give them access to transportation restore the service area to the way it was in 2011.
Thank you for your comments, uh, Robin Kincaid. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Robin Kincaid, and I believe it's the maybe 10th or 11th time that I've come before the commission. Um, I don't believe that the commission is responding to the growth that has occurred in Southern Nevada. Um, it's essential that the fixed route and the paratransit grow with the area and that persons with disabilities have access to essential services. My daughter, my family, and I, we live in the service area. But we can't access things outside the service area, like our church, the assigned post office, and other established businesses. It's really evident to citizens like myself that there really isn't a process in place to expand either the fixed route or in the actual paratransit service area. So once again, I'm asking for the process that reflects the challenges that in particularly in the over 55 communities, which house people with disabilities, those communities cannot demonstrate the need for fixed route services. They can't stand out in the cold like it is when we get really cold. They can't stand out in the 120 degree heat to be able to generate the numbers. It, it's not even feasible and we are continuing to expand this community with over 55 type communities that will never have transportation uh, to meet their needs. And once again, the isolation will continue to be there for these people with disabilities and senior citizens. But previously in, the, in other comment periods that I've done, I've, I've asked, we've come with some ideas, some, some solutions. Can we create a premium priced area to cover the gaps and the fingers that are not in the service area? So at least there'd be some type of service uh, for persons with disabilities. My daughter could get to the post office because the problem is, is that that finger is on one side of the street has service for people with disabilities, but on the other side of the street it doesn't. So again, we um, are isolating pockets of people that create a, a serious problem for people with disabilities to have access to essential services. Um, I also recently reported a situation in, in the complaint mechanism um, regarding my daughter not being able to be picked up and the driver uh, literally just driving by. And so I asked the situation to be investigated and I, I feel confident that there will be an investigation and we'll get some kind of response. But one of the things I asked previously was what was the complaints and um, Mr. Helen was kind enough to send me some raw numbers but I'm actually asking you to go a little further. I want to know what the, you know, are there dispositions? Can we describe what the complaint was about? Can we use that data to improve the training for TransDev? I, I feel like that's really reasonable. Um, again, I would just appreciate opportunity for that information to make this a more transparent type system. So I'm going to conclude. Um, I just want to remind you, you know, this time of year, it, for me, it brings forth reflections of the year's accomplishments and also shows still what needs to be done to support the transportation needs for student citizens with disabilities who live in Southern Nevada. It's also time to think about, you know, what we need to accomplish in the future. But it reminds us that we still have hope for the future. I think we all need to carry that element of hope. And so my hope is, is that the commission is going to find a way in 2019 to expand the paratransit service area to meet the needs of a growing population that includes citizens that do not have, again, access to essential services. Thank you for your time and happy holidays to all of you. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm gonna make it short today. Everybody knows why I'm here and you know what I'm fighting for. But I challenge you all to go home this holiday season. Think about us persons with disabilities who may not be able to go everywhere we want to go or who may not be able to go anywhere because they don't have any transportation. 
Think about us as you're driving along, going to the places that you want to go to, visiting the family that you want to visit, and seeing the loved ones that you want to see. Think about us when we're at home because we can't travel to those different places. I, I, I think that maybe even I challenge even one of you to work with RTC, work with Transdev, schedule buses one day out of for your whole day to see what it's like to be in our to be in our situation. Thank you and have a Merry Christmas. Thank you. Dorothy Barnes. Hi, my name is Dorothy Barnes, uh, Las Vegas resident. Uh, thank you for this time. I want to say I went to the doctor yesterday. My knees are really giving me a lot of trouble. I injured my knee at a bus stop some time ago at Las Vegas Boulevard in Lake Mead, and I had an injection, injection of cortisone in my knee, and I'm stuck on anti-inflammatory Celindac, which is generic for clinorol. I'm stuck on this pill twice a day. It makes me run to the restroom. I went to the doctor yesterday. I didn't get to see my regular doctor at UMC uh, Primary Care. I saw another doctor, and I was telling her, a doctor that looked at my knee before said, I don't know who's doctoring on you for this injury, but it started out with a bone and joint specialist where Chief's moved his office, and I don't know where he went. But the doctor that took me over at that, that clinic retired, and so there was only two doctors left. And the doctor I have now, I won't give his name, but... He's having a problem with the drug addicted people out on Nellis, and I'm having a problem with them lying and holding me out. Won't turn my name over. And just as I left the doctor's office, I wrote the BHX to Henderson to Water Street, only to come out and find out I couldn't get off Water Street, stuck with my knees hurting. And I don't know what happens when that construction, I don't know what kind of thing they're doing with Water Street. I'm sure it's to improve the street but what time they let the people know it's being blocked off so there's no public transportation up and down Water Street a certain time of the night, the BHX, the HDX, and the 217. A group of us was standing there trying to figure out wh where's the bus going, wh can we get a bus? And finally people started walking down Water Street. It took me a lot of effort to walk with my knees hurting, to walk from Water Street to uh, Lake Mead and Boulder Highway to wait on a bus to get back down to Las Vegas, and uh, it's a long walk when your knees are hurting and you're 61 years old, 61, almost 62. <laughs> Tell my knees that, and uh, I don't know if I lose some weight, maybe that will help my knees, but right now I'm stuck with my weight, with the medicine that made me gain weight, medication that made me gain weight, and with the injury to my knee, and I maybe I need another injection of cortisone, which people are warning me that's a dangerous shot to take if the doctor won't let you in there to see things on that shot. I can't get them to turn my name over. It should have been turned over long before I left Louisiana, so I'm not blaming Las Vegas. Louisiana was my stumbling block, and I came here to get away from them, to hide away. The people trailed me here, followed me here to get money. They couldn't do without me in Louisiana because they were missing revenue. Now they got people out on me here that wants money for drugs and stuff. It's killing me. I, I'm, I don't know if I'll see my 62nd birthday uh, in June because uh, when the new year come in, I'd like to say old acquaintance be forgot. I'd like to forget these people that's out on me for money. They have a problem, and I, they're giving me a problem. Thank you. God bless you. I won't tell you. Happy holidays to everyone. Thank you. And I'm sorry you returned. And good luck. Thank you. Alina Dupree. Chairperson Brown and members, thank you, Alita Dupree, for the record. It's good to see you again, uh, Commissioner. Uh, the cookies at the Convention Center meeting were great. Good breakfast. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about mostly buses and vehicles today. Uh, I've lost count of how many of these meetings I've been to, but I'm, I gain dividends each time I come. So I'm pleased about the report of new buses that are coming out. I'll let you know when I get on an 18 series 60-footer. Uh, um, that will help me on the 113 and the 115. 
to enjoy those sideways facing seats, 11 of them, the hard seats with the blue dots. Good for my back. So this is very welcome to me. I'll call it a holiday present, thank you. Uh, I'm very encouraged about these uh, lift and tango programs. Um, I went with a good friend to a medical appointment and uh, her medical plan uses a lift um, system uh, of where they arrange the pickups and I was really impressed. It, it works. Uh, really great flexibility. I hope we can expand this. I use veterans medical transportation on occasion and I, I would get into that lift car. I'll be the first one uh, because I know it will help me and give me the flexibility and it costs less money which means that we can help more people. I don't need to ride on the big bus. Uh, let's get the space on the big bus for those who do need to ride on the big bus. So uh, I use TNCs uh, sometimes and I know that it um, affects uh, your numbers, but you're still getting 3250 a month from me when I'm here. I have 3250 uh, for a 30-day pass in my app right now. Uh, and in looking at fair payment, I don't know what the future pay fair payment is. I'm, I, I am shifting my messages a bit. I mean, I'm intrigued about this thing called open source. I don't know if stored value is the answer anymore. Uh, but uh, you know, I went to the monorail and I bought full price tickets on my phone. And yes, I get the paper ones for a dollar. I can buy two at a time or 20 at a time. But I paid for those electronic tickets because I was tired of paper tickets. I want better for myself. And I want better for this agency because I know what's good for this agency is going to be good for me. So it's good to get some more dividends in my visit today. I'll let you know uh, when I get on the, uh, a new 60-foot bus and render my report in the new year. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak to the board? Seeing and hearing no one, we thank you all. Merry Christmas, enjoy the holiday season. See you in 19.